Hi everyone, welcome back for this last and final episode of this fantastic epic history TV series on Napoleon. Today we will review Waterloo. Napoleon's return is a bit of the final jump scare in an horror movie. You know when the villain you think is dead suddenly reappears to scare everyone before taking 50 bullets in the body. Or it's like a farewell tour for an artist coming back to say goodbye to his public. So what I understand here is that the episode lasts 13 minutes, which seems a bit short to cover the 100 days and the Battle of Waterloo. So we'll see, let's go. April 1814. For 10 years, one man has dominated Europe. Napoleon Bonaparte, Emperor of the French. Under his military genius, France conquered an empire that spanned the continent. But finally, he has been defeated by a grand coalition of his enemies. Napoleon is forced to abdicate and exiled to the tiny island of Elba. While the Bourbon monarchy is restored to France in the corpulent form of Louis XVIII. The restoration is a constitutional monarchy under Louis XVIII based on the English model. The first objective for this new regime is to win over the masses by lowering taxes. For example, in the Paris at the end of the empire, a glass of wine was taxed at 94% to found the Napoleonic Wars. The problem is that the regime was immensely indebted and the loss of the conquest have halved the tax revenues, so the king has to make concessions and the army will be the victim of these concessions. So it will drastically cut the military budget, divide the workforce and divide the officer's salary by two. This throws thousands of people into poverty. On top of the soldiers, you have all the army suppliers, the bakers, the weavers, the workers. So he makes himself immensely unpopular and loses the support of the army. But rumors soon reach Napoleon that France would welcome his return. The French people have little love for the monarchy or its hangers-on, the very people whose excesses led to the French Revolution 25 years before. He also learns that at the Congress of Vienna, his enemies are locked in bitter dispute over the future of Europe. Napoleon decides to act. So at Vienna, meanwhile, there are immense difficulties between the winners who have already very different geopolitical agendas when it comes, for example, to the questions of what to do with Poland and Italy and with the former Napoleon's conquest in uh, Wallonia or in the Rhineland. How were these which had been under the influence of the French Revolution within the 20 past years are going to be managed? How do we return to the old feudal system? And Talleyrand was there and he interfered because he was not welcome at first because he was a French. And in order to sneak in during the negotiations, he was holding magnificent receptions, was speaking in private with each of the great leaders and defended the idea that the Allies were not fighting France but on Napoleon to ease the terms on the country. After just 10 months in exile, he returns to France, where the troops sent to arrest him rally to his cause instead. Most of France soon follows suit. But in Vienna, the coalition... So here we just briefly mentioned the flight of the eagle and it was too short for. It's very epic. So when he comes back, Napoleon carefully avoids areas where the empire is unpopular, notably the major ports still loyal to the monarchy. For example, he chooses Lyon and cities like this who benefited enormously from the empire. So several regiments are sent to stop Napoleon and the soldiers for whom Napoleon is a hero 
hesitate before the emperor. They start to talk amongst themselves. Then Napoleon's civilian followers, such as bourgeois, lawyers, notables, and so on, come to them and parley. And finally, a captain has the men kneel before the royalist flag, which was also unpopular. Then he orders the soldiers to fire and nothing happened. Then Napoleon steps forward and the rest you know it. Soldiers, if you want to shoot at your emperor, do it. And the rest is history. And also Maréchal Ney, who now responds to the Bourbon, promises to bring back Napoleon in an iron cage, but in front of his former emperor. Ney collapses, and then the king flees to Belgium. Immediately put their differences to one side. They declare Napoleon an outlaw and mobilize their forces for war. Napoleon knows he must act boldly before the coalition launches a coordinated invasion of France. He counts on winning a quick victory and then negotiating peace from a position of strength. He targets the coalition armies within easiest reach. Prince Blücher's Prussian army and the Duke of Wellington's Anglo-Allied army, both camped in Belgium. Napoleon's force is a match for either coalition army on its own. But he'll be heavily outnumbered if they're able to join forces. So he must keep them apart and defeat each in turn. Napoleon's army crosses the frontier near Charleroi, intending to drive a wedge between the two coalition armies. The next day, Napoleon sends his left wing under Marshal Ney to take the crossroads at Quatre Bras. There. Quatre Bras means four arms. It's a big crossroad, vital to control the operation if you want to separate both armies and Ney conducts the operation without clear orders from Napoleon. And I think that Wellington is nearly captured there. Ney clashes with Wellington's army, still scrambling into position. The Allied troops fight off a series of French attacks and just manage to hold their ground. The same day, Napoleon attacks Blücher's Prussian army with his main force near the village of Ligny. The battle is a brutal slugging match, but the French emerge triumphant. The 72-year-old Blücher leads a cavalry charge in person and has his horse killed under him. He only just escapes capture. The Prussian uh, Ligny is a very bloody battle fought street by street, Napoleon manages to defeat Blücher while being outnumbered 2-3 to three and facing a heavily entrenched enemy. The decisive actions there were carried out by the old Imperial Guard and the pursuit was particularly problematic, ordered too late by an exhausted Napoleon not only exhausted but also ill, and this pursuit lacked vigor. A quick word on Napoleon at this point. So Napoleon was ill, complaining of headaches, terrible stomach pains, and other even less glorious things that prevented him from riding his horse and therefore from conducting his own reconnaissance as he had done in his prime time. And above all, the return and all the administrative work he had to do totally exhausted him. In particular, he had to write hundreds of letters with requests and directives in all directions. So he was dead tired. The army retreats, but it is not broken. Napoleon sends his right wing under Marshal Grouchy to keep them on the run, and turns his own attention to Wellington's army. The British general doesn't receive news of Blücher's defeat until the next morning, at which point he orders a retreat through heavy summer showers to a position eight miles south of Brussels, near the village of Waterloo. 
There, he receives a promise from Blücher that the Prussians will march to his aid the next morning. So Wellington decides to stand and fight. Wellington has chosen his battlefield with care. His troops are behind a gentle ridge which will give them some shelter from French cannon fire. His right flank is anchored on the farmhouse of Hougoumont, his centre on the farm of La Haye Sainte, and his left on the farm of Papillot. All three are fortified and garrisoned with elite troops. And these elite troops are equipped with rifles instead of muskets, which make them much more accurate and deadly. And I think many of these elite troops come from the German states controlled by England, like Hanover. Wellington's men need every advantage they can get. The opposing armies are roughly equal in size, but his is a ragtag mix of British, Dutch and German troops, many of whom have never seen combat before. They will have to hold off Napoleon's army of veterans until Prussian reinforcements arrive, or the battle, and probably the war, will be lost. Probably the war? Mm, I think that's a very, very bold thing to say. First, what war? Just against England and Prussia? Or against also Austria and the rest of the Allies, Russia particularly? Um, I'm not sure anybody is going to give up just with one defeat. And you will have hundreds of thousands of Allied soldiers ready to converge to invade France. But on the other hand, internally, Minister of War, Davou, is accomplishing a feat by rebuilding the army at breakneck speed, which will allow France to raise thousands of new soldiers, but the Allies are likely to throw in even more soldiers. So. Yeah, it's alt history, but I'd say that probably if Napoleon wins Waterloo, the war is nowhere near finished nor won. Sunday dawns bright and fair. Napoleon has ordered Marshal Grouchy to pursue the Prussians and keep them busy while he defeats Wellington's army at Waterloo and opens the road to Brussels. But it's Grouchy who gets pinned down, fighting the Prussian rearguard at Wavre. The main Pru And on top of that, he pursues them in the wrong direction. He assumes they are retreating northeast, and actually Blücher is retreating to Waterloo to make junction with Wellington. Russian force eludes him and is already marching to Wellington's aid. At Waterloo, Napoleon delays his attack, waiting for the ground to dry, which will make movement easier for his troops. But the lost hours will later prove costly. Not only to move for his troops, but to make his artillery effective. He assembles a grand battery with 80 guns, but the very good positioning of the Allies behind the ridge and the mud uh, that has been created because of the heavy rains make the cannonballs sink instead of, you know, bouncing and inflicting damages. The battle begins around 11 a.m., when Napoleon orders a feint against Wellington's right flank at Hougoumont. He hopes Wellington will commit his reserves here, drawing them away from the centre, where the main blow will fall. But Hougoumont's British and German defenders cling on desperately throughout the day. At one point, the French force their way through the main gate, but it's shut behind them and the intruders are all killed. Wellington later calls it the decisive moment of the battle. This first attack is led by Jérôme Bonaparte, who is as good tactician as his brother, but it's not Napoleon, it's Joseph. Uh, he launches a very poorly coordinated, poorly executed attack with no artillery preparation. So um, actually, the attack on Hougoumont is 
yes, as they said, to distract the allies and to attract the best allied divisions. But anyway, it's uh, a slaughter and it's very, very poorly executed. Around noon, 80 French cannon open fire against the main Allied line. Most of Wellington's men are out of sight on the reverse slope, but many cannonballs still find their mark, smashing bloody holes in the Allied ranks. At 1.30pm, Napoleon sends in his infantry. The French columns are met by disciplined musket fire, and then charged by British heavy cavalry. The French attack disintegrates as Napoleon's men try to save themselves from the crushing hooves and flashing sabres. Scores of Frenchmen are ridden down, and two of their famous eagle standards are captured. I think this charge is led by General Picton, who we previously saw in Spain. But the British cavalry, exhilarated by success, charge too far. They become scattered, their horses blown. At their most vulnerable, they're countercharged by French cavalry and suffer terrible losses. Among the dead, Major General Sir William Ponsonby, commander of the Union Brigade. Around 4 p.m., Marshal Ney thinks he sees the Allies begin to retreat and leads a mass cavalry charge to drive home the advantage. But Ney is wrong. The Allied infantry are ready, formed in hollow squares, with bayonets fixed. The French cavalry can't break into these impregnable formations. They can only circle impotently until they retreat or are shot from the saddle. Ney's so a new example of the lack of coordination where Napoleon is not actually in charge. So we don't know what's going on in Ney's head as Ney is a bit peculiar. Uh, anyway, Waterloo is a very confused battle with a dense fog and you cannot see a thing. So we don't really know what Ney thinks, but at some point he thinks he sees the beginning of a British retreat. He launches this charge, but the problem is that Ney will never have a chance to explain because he is going to be shot a couple months afterwards. So he launches not one, not two, but 13 charges and Ney has four horses killed on him. Actually, uh, this charge took a bit the Allies by surprise because I read an anecdote from an English soldier who is standing next to a pipe smoking man who who can stop talking and who's very annoying. And suddenly the earth starts to shake and the French cavalrymen appear and he describes it as a sea of metal and it creates a start of panic in the British ranks. But that's where the discipline of the British army will shine because they managed to very quickly form the squares under an immense pressure. His failure to support this attack with either infantry or artillery is a serious blunder. Meanwhile, Blücher's Prussians have begun to arrive. They capture the village of Plancenoit, threatening Napoleon's flank and forcing him to send reserves to recapture it. Around 6 p.m., French infantry finally capture the farmhouse of La Haye Sainte in the centre of the battlefield. It allows the French to bring forward artillery and blast the Allied squares from close range. They can't. And so, after this insane cavalry charge, and um, Napoleon emerges and reminds everybody the plan is to launch a diversion attack on Hougomont and seize La Essente, who's the key of the defensive system of the Allies. And when he managed to do so, and to bring in his horse artillery, things are going to turn very badly for the Brits. Miss the closely packed formations, and casualties quickly mount. It begins to seem that if Wellington's army doesn't retreat, 
it will be killed where it stands. But the situation for Napoleon is also desperate. The Prussians are arriving in force, and he's running out of men to throw against Wellington's army. So he turns to his ultimate reserve, the elite Imperial Guard, the most feared troops in Europe. At 7.30pm, 3,000 of these battle-hardened veterans march past their Emperor and across the corpse-strewn battlefield towards the Allied centre. These are the Grognards, the Grawlers, the Grenadiers of the old Imperial Guard. They are immense, with their bare fur cap, their regulation moustache, their big braids of hair and their golden shield earrings. They've survived all the toughest campaigns. Hello, the Russian campaign, Leipzig, the French campaign. This is their last chance. Wellington's redcoats rise to meet them and pour devastating volleys of musket fire into their ranks. When the Allies fix bayonets and prepare to charge, the Imperial Guard wavers and then retreats. And so this is another iconic moment, the moment where the concealed British infantry rise to their feet and unleash a hellish volley that kills hundreds of grognards and the old guard staggered and retreated and the sight of these invincible soldiers retreating creates instantly a panic within the French ranks. Wellington, sensing victory, orders a general advance. About the same time, the Prussians recapture Plans Noir. News of the Imperial Guard's defeat and rumours of encirclement by the Prussians sweep through the French ranks. Panic breaks out and the French army flees the battlefield. Only Napoleon's old guard maintain their discipline, mounting a heroic but doomed rearguard action. Cambron, who's in charge of this last square, is asked twice to surrender. First he replies, the guard dies but does not surrender, and the second time he just answers, merde! Napoleon himself is forced to abandon his carriage and barely escapes the pursuing Prussian cavalry. The battle is won. The Duke of Wellington and Prince Blücher meet and congratulate each other outside Napoleon's former headquarters, an inn called La Belle Alliance. Blücher thinks it's the perfect name for their shared victory, but Wellington prefers the more English-sounding Waterloo, where he has his own headquarters. The Battle of Waterloo was, in the words of the Duke of Wellington, a damned near-run thing. It was also one of the bloodiest battles of the age. Around 50,000 men were killed or wounded, 23,000 coalition casualties, 27,000 French. Due to an appalling shortage of medical care, many of the wounded were left lying on the battlefield for several days. Napoleon was utterly defeated. Unable to raise another army, he surrendered to the British. It's not that he cannot raise another army, it's that his internal situation is precarious. And it was even before Waterloo. Internally, he has very little support, apart from the army, which has just been destroyed. And there are several civil wars in several provinces going on, so there is no other chance. They transported him to a second exile on the tiny remote Atlantic island of St. Helena. This time... Actually, it was Talleyrand who suggested to send Napoleon in St. Helena or to the Azores. There was no escape. He died there six years later. Waterloo marked the beginning of a period of relative peace in Europe. 
there were no wars between the great powers for 40 years, and the British would not fight on the continent for another 100 years, until the summer of 1914. Forty years after the battle, a pioneer in the new art of photography captured these remarkable images. They're veterans of Napoleon's armies, by then all old men in their 70s and 80s. Among them, Sergeant Tanya of the Imperial Guard, Moray of the 2nd Regiment of Hussars, and Verlin of the 2nd Guard Lancers. These faces are a tantalising link to the dramatic events that shaped the course of history two centuries ago. That's incredible. And actually, Napoleon's last battle will also be his biggest triumph, is the writing of his memoir that is going to cement his legend. And till this day, something like, I don't have the number anymore, but thousands of books have been written on that dude, which makes him the second well-known character in history, maybe after Jesus Christ. So not that bad for a medium-sized Corsican dude. Anyway, this whole adventure was a treat for me to cover. Thank you guys very much for watching and talk to you soon for new adventures. Bye.